In this video, we are going to learn what is edge computing, what are the edge computing architecture trends, edge computing frameworks, edge analytics, the intersection of digital twins and edge computing, edge solution management and orchestration, security, the role of edge computing in 5G, and finally, we are going to learn about the Moab Connected Intelligence Platform. My guest to help impart that knowledge is Rob Tiffany. Rob is currently the Vice President and Head of IoT Strategy at Ericsson. His role is driving strategy and execution at the intersection of 5G, edge computing, and the Internet of Things. Previously, he was the founder and CEO of Enterprise IoT, where he created an edge computing system powered by digital twins that targeted industrial operations. He was also the CTO and Global Product Manager at Hitachi, where he created the Lumada Industrial IoT Platform, which was recently put in the Leadership Quadrant for Gartner's Industrial IoT Magic Quadrant. He was also the Global Technology Lead at Microsoft, where he was one of the co-authors of the Azure IoT Reference Architecture. And he was also the Senior Product Manager for Windows Mobile. Welcome to the fourth generation podcast here on industry40.tv, which is a series of weekly interviews designed to help you learn industrial IoT from some of the world's leading practitioners. So make sure to subscribe and click on that notification bell to make sure that you never miss any of the videos. If you find this conversation interesting, please review it with five stars on Apple Podcasts, follow on Spotify, and you can also connect with me on LinkedIn at Kudzai Mandi Teresa. Now, here's my conversation with Rob. Rob, thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Thanks, man. Okay, so yeah, I think we'll just jump right into it. Um, right. So how would you uh, define edge computing and... Uh, uh, um, what are the business cases in, in an industrial setting? All right. I always get in trouble trying to define edge computing. Um, I've learned over the years, it turns out there's many edges. <laughs> yeah. um, especially, you know, so um, if I go back in time and I spent more time, uh, maybe more in the industrial manufacturing setting with edge, uh, especially when I was at Hitachi, doing Lumata, you know, I, I, I thought about edge computing primarily as, um, you know, these little gateway type edge devices compute that might be near machines in a factory uh, and they might talk to PLCs or they might connect to lots of different machines and aggregate data, you know, using all kinds of weird wire protocols that you see in the industrial setting that are pretty bizarre to most people, I think, uh, with serial ports and things. And so that was kind of my first feeling about what edge computing was, was just initially it was almost like a data router in some ways, almost like, um, you know, like a, a Cisco router getting stuff from inside out to the internet. Um, you know, cause when I first, when I was, when I was doing I IOT at Microsoft and we were building Azure IOT uh, in the cloud, I think there was a naive idea that, IoT was going to be trillions of IPv6 devices all connecting to the cloud. And of course, they were wrong. <laughs> as soon as you went into a building, that's not how things worked. Uh, and so then there was a baby step of, oh, well, well, we'll route things that are inside a building through some edge gateway thing out to the internet. Uh, but that didn't always turn out to be true either. Um, uh, you know, and you saw the rise of discussions of things like fog computing uh, along the way. But the idea of, hey, you know what, I need the answer to my question really quickly in milliseconds. And so the idea of moving this edge compute closer to machines uh, where I can get telemetry and maybe I can put, you know, started off by putting basic analytics, you know, could be if this, then that, you know, like a complex event processor kind of thing on these edge devices, you know, a little piece, a rugged PC. So you started seeing that. Um, I certainly talked to people who go, well, maybe the edge is right on the machine. Um, if the, the particular piece of machinery, let's say in a factory has enough embedded compute networking and 
storage capabilities, maybe it can do some analytics right there on the machine itself. And I'll hear people say, well, isn't that the edge too? Maybe. Um, and then I'd say more recently, more interestingly, since I've been with Ericsson, uh, in the telecom world uh, with mobile operators and cellular and obviously all this 5G, they've got a view of the edge where it's running at the edge of the cellular network. Um, and so maybe at a base station, like the bottom of a cellular tower, uh, or inside uh, data centers that are inside a city that no one even knows about, these, um, these metro data centers that are controlled by mobile operators. Uh, they all have something in common. They're all trying to intercept the data sooner, closer to the machine than if you wait till you get to some distant cloud, for instance, uh, and then being able to analyze and take actions on that data and insights you know, more quickly and more closely. Um, so it's, it's certainly grown into a spectrum of edges, for sure, depending on who you talk to. You know, the business case for the edge uh, is latency a lot of times and speed. Uh, I want to be closer to the data so I can, again, if I'm putting analytics, pushing, you'll see people using containers to push analytics out to the edge some, in lots of different ways. Uh, I want to get answers to my questions. I want to do that closer. Uh, other business cases are also around uh, like security or data sovereignty. Uh, a lot of big, you know, especially when I was doing stuff in manufacturing with Hitachi, you know, lots of companies where the plant manager of a factory still says the data doesn't leave my factory and it will never go to the cloud. And so I have to do everything on premise uh, and maybe not even in a data center, maybe putting compute, computers, machines right there on the factory floor. Um, and so interesting different business cases, but a lot of it is around speed and performance. Um, I'll tell you one interesting thing. Back when I remember when I was uh, at Microsoft, when we were incubating Azure IoT, I remember us talking to some people, at, at, there's a big factory you know, plant north of Seattle, and we tell them about how all the amazing capabilities that Azure IoT had and streaming analytics and machine learning. And I just remember the guy saying, that's just great. Tell me the version of that that runs right here because it cost me too much money. <laughs> he goes, I have all these big machines that I use to make even bigger machines in my factory and they are spitting out terabytes of data every hour. And it's too expensive for me to send that terabytes of data over expensive bandwidth to your distant cloud to munch on that data for a while and maybe come up with some insights. Uh, and so expense, just bandwidth, depending on how much data they send. So, you know, you see all kinds of business cases around the edge for sure. Oh, okay, interesting. Uh, you mentioned uh, edge computing spectrum because uh, like we've got like different kinds of, of edge computing architectures, trends that we've seen uh, and you also mentioned uh, fork computing, you've got your edge, you've got fork computing, and we've also got what is called multi-access uh, edge computing. Like, I've always wondered, where is the line of demarcation? Would you be able to, like, clearly state where exactly do they, like, uh, go different parts? Yeah. You know, so much of this is just marketing. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. like lots of things in life um you know uh, you know i remember it was a lot of the guys at cisco who were doing yeah. fog computing uh if you'll remember many years ago when they started doing marketing around the internet of everything um and so and so the you know the funny thing is and it is part of it is marketing and trying to yeah. not lose uh i think a lot of companies looked at the hyperscale cloud players like Azure IoT, AWS IoT Core, things like that, and seeing the success they were having, and they felt like, well, we need to have good reasons why we can be successful without going to the cloud. And so companies that were building infrastructure, compute infrastructure on premise, you know, kind of went through some of the things we just talked about, you know, latency, you know, security cost, all kinds of things like that as good reasons why there's that fog computing or edge computing and why you should do it there. 
you know, and so these lines that, you know, people were talking about fog before I started hearing about edge. They may be the same or blend over, uh, yeah. but fog was some kind of continuum between the machine and still on prem, but maybe before you get to the cloud. So maybe pre processing, stuff like that, aggregating data from a bunch of different machines. Um, and so fog was on prem. I always got the impression, I could be wrong, that fog computing could be in a nearby data center that could be adjacent to where all your machines are that you're talking to in a factory. Um, and then certainly edge computing really got a lot closer uh, to, to the machines. Uh, you see, you know, there's so many people who jumped into the IoT sp space. Just, you know, they jumped on the bandwagon. Lots of big companies, lots of startups. They're all trying to, you know, to the next big mega trend, right? And so you saw all kinds of people doing so many crazy things um, to, to get on that. And so um, those lines of demarcation were just all over the place. Um, it's, really, it's really hard to say. And so a lot of times I'll just try to, I'll just say, you know what? It's just a location. We're, we're still doing the same stuff. I'm still doing compute yeah. somewhere. And it might be farther away or closer to the machine, uh, just depending on a business case. Oh, yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Of course, if I would, you yeah. know, one of, the, one of the big cases, though, for edge computing, where it's really clear if we leave the, if we leave buildings for a little while and leave factories, if I like, if I'm thinking of a remote scenario, like uh, oil and gas, if I'm out in the middle of West Texas or Saudi Arabia or wherever yeah. uh, at, a, at a pump, pumping gas and they're out in the middle of nowhere. And so the need for edge computing, you know, to analyze what's going on with that oil well was critical because you find out that people in that business have different constraints and, you know, their communications costs were higher. In some places where there's no network, there's no cellular coverage, they would be using expensive satellite connectivity and it costs a lot of money to send data over satellite and they don't like to do it. Yeah. And so the idea where I could take an intelligent edge compute capability and put it right out their oil rig uh, and have it wired in and connected with everything and, and then also making decisions locally right there at the edge. Uh, certainly a super important use case, you know, for things that are remote like that. Yeah, yeah. Now in, in terms of, um implementation what, what what edge computing frameworks uh, stand stand out for you and, and like what would you say are the factors one should like consider when selecting an, an edge computing framework wow that's a good one i don't know if there's any good standard edge frameworks everybody seems to be building their own thing it's like you're in that early part of a new market where everyone's trying to win yeah. And so you have lots of different players and they're all building their own proprietary technology to do the same thing. And so um, that's a really good question. Cause you know, as you can imagine, one of the problems with edge computing uh, that people don't think about is uh, orchestration of edge nodes. Um, like for instance, if I'm just doing cloud IOT, it's a, uh, you know, it's a hub and spoke one, one place for many devices. And yeah. so, in some ways it makes it simpler. With edge, I might be deploying thousands of edge nodes to locations and doing different types of analytics or compute in all those locations, but I need to orchestrate them. And so maybe somewhere at a centralized location, and this gets to like what framework are you using? What is that, that I hate when people say, what that single pane of glass where maybe it's in the cloud, but it's a central location where I can put in whatever analytics I want to do and I want to push it down to the edge device and then orchestrate, you know, and gosh, you can imagine with telecom, the idea of doing mech inside of base stations and cell towers, pushing edge nodes out and new compute ideas to the local devices that may be talking to it. It gets super complicated really fast. Um, you know, um, if I, if I think of different players who are doing edge compute that are trying to orchestrate it, um, you know, early on you got Greengrass from AWS, yeah. uh, 
there's the Azure IoT Edge, you know, when they're pushing stuff in containers. Uh, I worked with folks, are you familiar with an IoT company called Losent? Losent, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, they, they do a good job of orchestrating analytics and pushing down containers to edge nodes. Um, there's certainly some open source edge, you know, I, I, bet, I don't know if you've been involved at that edge X foundry. Uh, um, come, come across. It. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I've been involved with them for a long time. Um, but of course they started with the idea of just kind of this isolated edge node that was going to insert, do pull in data, do something, maybe go upstream to a cloud. It didn't necessarily have the idea of orchestrating it though, a framework for orchestrating mini nodes uh, that may have changed by now. Um, the Eclipse Foundation uh, is doing some things with, there's a few projects in the Eclipse IoT where they're doing some edge things like that. Um, but it's, it's an interesting question. It's a, it's, a, it's a much harder problem to solve. And so you definitely have to have a, a good framework. Uh, I think another, there's a company in Stockholm called Crosser um, yeah. that, that does some edge compute. And they have kind of a, kind of like Losent, they have a nice visual tool to drag and drop, you know, from a PLC using OPC UA to yeah, kind of like whatever. Red. Yeah, it looks like Node-RED. Yeah, it's very much like Node-RED, absolutely. Um, but again, you know, these are, these are obviously individual companies who are doing things like that. But there's, there's certainly some good ideas out there, for oh, yeah. sure. Yeah. So in a way, we can say the common baseline here is container technology. That's, 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 that's something that is common throughout all these frameworks. It Correct. seems that way, but, but there are some other companies that are doing something different. Because I do spend a lot of time talking, just like you do. Yeah. Um, there's another company that focuses on, there's a company called Swim, swim.ai, and they have edge nodes, it's almost like they're sprinkling little agents across mm -hmm. devices everywhere. They don't use containers. In fact, they don't follow a lot of the rules that we think of. Yeah. Uh, and they have incredible advanced technology. Um, when I think of edge analytics, um, I think I, they may all be like Java virtual machines, but they kind of act like, um, you know, in programming, how there's a, you heard of an actor framework uh, is a different pattern for doing software development. It comes from that language, Erlang. Anyway, they've got yeah. technology where all these actors are, it's almost like threads in software, but they're even smaller. And each thread is carrying about one particular sensor or one machine on its own. And they distribute, it's really remarkable technology. I've seen them, they'll, they, they put the technology out there, maybe on Raspberry Pis even. Yeah. They don't program it. They don't tell it what to do and they just start having the data come in to these edge devices and these agents just observe the data over time, maybe for a day or two. And then they determine the shape of the data, the data types, what they think. They create digital twins on the fly mm -hmm. then they create machine learning models on the fly at the edge and they uh -huh. train them at the edge and they don't use containers and they, it's, it's pretty crazy advanced technology it's always interesting when you look around and see what people yeah, are doing sounds very but yeah you should, you should check them out sometime it's pretty cool yeah we'll definitely check them out sounds very very interesting yeah yeah no, so now it it at application level what sort of um analytics would you say are like i'm a, 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 a best suited for for for, for deployment at the edge because i'm I believe we still have that kind of, of, of decision that we have to make. What, what workloads do we run at the cloud? What workloads do we, do, do we run at the edge? What would you say are the kind of analytics that are best suited to, to deploy at the edge? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, well, like lots of things, start small with baby steps. Um, you know, I think the first easy use case is just data filtering, which yeah. I know doesn't sound very exciting. Um, but at the end, you know, it, you, know, you know how there's different, I, I'm going to say, in the data world, you have kind of two kinds of people. There's the big data people that say, I want all the data, I don't care, and I'm going to put it in a data lake, and I'm going to find a needle in the haystack. And then there's other people who are saying, most of that data is noise, and it's junk, and it's not, it's not, it's useless, and it's just taking up space. And so you can imagine data filtering at the edge where 
if a data packet's coming in from a machine, a device, um, and you can just do simple filtering. You can say, you know, like for a temperature value coming in from one data point from a sensor, you know, you just say, hey, if this new value is the same as the last one I got, then let's drop the packet. Let's not take the data in there. And, uh, and a lot of people will find a lot of value. And, I think, and so I think that's the basic first step is just filtering out data that's not changing all the time. Yeah. You know, because a lot of people will operate on based on exceptions. And so start with filtering. And then the next thing is, is then, um, you know, KPIs. Um, so I've built a lot of this stuff. I've built edge computing stuff. Um, you know, I, I've, I spent a lot of time. I know you've talked to some folks about digital twins. I did a lot of digital twin creation at, for Lumata at Hitachi. And so some of the ideas on the digital twin where you're defining, you know, what's that machine look like? What, what's the shape of the data? What are the data labels, the names? What are the data types? What's the unit of measure? Uh, but then you can go the next step further and also would define inside your digital twin, like KPIs, uh, or what's, what's the expected value I, I should be getting, you know, from this machine or from this one sensor, you know? And I know this sounds like simple things like thresholds, like you see in manufacturing that they've been doing for decades. But, uh, but you know, like if you're getting data from your car, uh, and it's like your car tire, and uh, let's just say 32 PSI, you know, pressure is the right amount. In your digital twin, you could define, hey, 32 is what I expect. You know, the green zone might be between 30 and 35. The yellow is when you're getting further away, and the red is when you're in big trouble with your tire. And so you can imagine as that data is flowing in, I think the key thing is, is uh, and again, I don't want to get off track here, but what, but pushing your digital twin logic and definitions down to edge computing is a good thing. Um, you know, because we have Moore's law who's giving us more compute power. We're able to put more RAM and more, you know, and so, so if when you're orchestrating your edge nodes from your, maybe your server or your cloud, you know, the machines that you're talking to maybe in a particular region that might or an area that might talk to that edge node. And so you would push the digital twins that match the machines that that edge node is going to talk to. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then that digital twin definition from its model or whatever, you know, could then make decisions on that telemetry data coming in. And so it might even define basic filtering, but then it might define KPIs. Um, there's like, there's always three parts to it. There's, you know, you, you define the, you know, it's all pattern matching, right? Yeah. You're defining, you're defining, here's what the data should look like. Here's the actual value coming in. And then here I define thresholds or what's, you know, the easy stuff, you know, filtering or green, yellow, red. Um, and then there's some kind of software, a bot, an agent, yeah. something that's acting on it. And so that bot is looking at the data and looking at what the twin tells it should be. And then it ma makes a decision and then maybe it fires an event and maybe you go further to alert something or you do some further analytics. Um, I think that's the next step. And so stick with that basic pattern matching, do the easy stuff first uh, before you start thinking about, do I need to do machine learning or something like that? If that makes sense, um, you know, I'm always a fan of getting the easy stuff out of the way. It's like taking a, a hard test. You answer all the all the questions you know first, yeah, and then absolutely. go back to the hard stuff. Absolutely. But I see I see too many people spending too much time talking about AI and machine learning, and a lot of times they don't even know what they're talking about. But I think I think sometimes they could scare customers, you know, because I think the average customer doesn't understand what some of that technology is. Yeah. It's easier to say, hey, let's, let's do the basics and you can actually get move the needle and, and I can get lots of value with this easy stuff. So definitely start there first at the edge. Yeah, it's certainly true. Now, the, the, there's some terms that you, 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 you actually mentioned there. Now, for the benefit of the, of the audience there, uh, as far as orchestration is concerned, I'm sure anyone listening or watching this uh, right now, you've come across Kubernetes or something like that. But could you like uh, explain uh, in a nutshell what uh, orchestration technologies really allow you to do? What are the benefits that, that, that come with using orchestration technologies in a edge computing setup? 
Yeah. I mean, you know, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to, uh, you've got a list of devices, you know, like a lot of times, like if you think of a normal IOT platform and you're registering devices or some kind of registry where you're entering device number one, two, three, four, five, and hit, here's its identity and here's its security token or whatever. And then you're doing the same thing with edge devices. I've got edge devices, machines, whatever, one through 100. And then for each one of those, you know, edge device number one might be talking to device one through 25. And, you know, you, you understand the next one's doing 25 through 50. Part of this is just organizi organizing for you as an administrator uh, to just have your head wrapped around it. Um, cause the, and, and, you wanna, and you might want to be able to see it visually. And so when I say orchestration, what I mean, it, it, it is organization. It's, it's saying I'm deploying these devices and these edge nodes and these endpoint devices belong to this particular edge node. And maybe I can see it visually in my IoT platform or whatever tool I'm using. Um, also though, how it connects back to your, your server or your cloud, maybe orchestrator, the, the single place, you know, kind of, uh, you know, like devices, we all understand that a device sends telemetry to your, your server, you catch that data and you do something with it. The edge nodes have to do the same thing. Uh, when you go configure an edge compute node in the field, whatever it happens to be, um, it needs to make an outbound only connection to your server, maybe the first time you turn it on. Uh, and it, because it has its own unique identifier and security token, calls into your platform and says, hey, I'm edge node number 75 and here's my security. And your platform goes, oh yeah, okay. I know who you are, you're cool. Uh, and then I see that you're supposed to talk to IOT devices one through 25. And I'm gonna, and so by making that connection and you know, behind the scenes, it's all databases and stuff, right? Uh, but by making that connection in the database and security wise, then the, your server platform can say, oh, okay, since you're talking to these devices, I'm going to download the digital twin definitions to you so that you'll know what to do locally because I might be disconnected from you sometimes. You may not be able to reach the cloud and you might have to keep working alone by yourself. So that orchestration is, is the organization. It's the connection. It's pushing the logic there. And again, being able to define the logic in one place. It could be simple things or it could be machine learning with containers like you talked about. Um, but, that, but that whole thing, you know, you, you need to have those data pathways to work. So, and there's always the security element to this deal. So not only is the edge authenticating, it's also good, I know this sounds weird, always just do outbound only connections from your IoT devices, as well as your edge devices. So the edge device should not ever be listening to get a connection from your cloud platform that's orchestrating. It should always do an outbound connection only because you don't wanna make a larger attack surface. You know, every time you're listening, like basically putting a web server or something, you're opening up your attack surface for hackers. And so having that edge node call out, here's who I am. Oh, thank you. Here's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that same outbound connection you made. You know, like if you're using a bi-directional thing like WebSockets or MQTT or different things, you know, you can download, download bits so it can do its thing. Whether it's using, and it may or may not be using containers, you never know. Um, but, then a bit, and, but then in your platform, you'll be able to see visually, I've got all these edge nodes and they're all over the world and they're talking to these devices and I know exactly what all of them is doing. Um, just so you won't go insane <laughs> with so many devices out there. So it's, it really is organization. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. Now, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about was like the, the relationship between digital twins and, and edge computing. But you, you've sort of like uh, already touched on that and I, I just want to like... Uh, check if I understand it, uh, how you put it. So in a, in a way, what you say, correct me if I'm wrong, a digital twin really is, can be used as some kind of reference, at, at something that you can push to the edge that the, dev the device will always check against and make decisions based on what, 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 what the twin is. Yeah, 
I, I mean, I know you've talked to folks about digital twins before, and I spend a lot of time. You know, there's that idea of a digital twin model that you may create one time that represents a base class or an asset class, like my car. You know, I, I, I used to like I always like to talk in terms of cars because everybody can understand it. You know, <laughs> and so if if it's a you know whatever a Ford F one fifty pickup truck is the asset model, and then the individual digital twin instances that are inherited from that model are the instances of all the Ford F-150 pickup trucks that are out there for sale. But it goes further than that. So at the model level, you define all the properties that make it up. And so you might say, okay, I'm gonna, my digital twin for this truck is information about the engine and oil pressure and the transmission and all, and the tire pressure and speed and all the things we think about that, that a car or a truck does. Um, all those things in the end are still defined and stored in a database somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it could be a relational database. It could be no SQL kind of object thing. It just depends on what you want to do. Uh, but you're defining this, this model. You define all the properties of it, the names of all those sensors, like right front tire pressure. You, you'll say that the data type is maybe integer, or a float, whatever. And then you might say the unit of measure is pressure. And the reason you do all those extra steps is because you're trying to help your analytics because your analytics don't necessarily understand the data that's coming at it. But if it's almost think of this digital twin model as a data dictionary, you know, for all the, all your audience members that maybe are database people, database administrator, it, that's really what it is. It's a definition. It's a data dictionary so that your bot or your analytics can look at and go, oh, this data, here's its name, it's, a, it's an integer and it's unit of measure is pressure. I know what that is. And so it can interact with that there. And then you have your digital twin, the actual instances that are catch, catching the real data from the real machine. Um, but there's all kinds of things. You know, you have telemetry properties that are one-to-one -one relationship with things like temperature and humidity and acceleration and all those sensors. You may also have uh, virtual kind of properties on your twin um, that don't map one-to-one -one with a particular sensor. Maybe it's a calculation yeah. uh, you know, between sensors that gives you a value there. You also may have defined command and control uh, properties in a digital twin that says, hey, I, it had, this machine has actuators and I can send a command to it. Like maybe I'm going to tell the motor, instead of going at 10,000 revolutions per minute, I want to go just 7,500. And so you'll define what is the name of that command that I can call. And again, what's the data type? What's the unit measure so that my, my analytics or my programming software knows how to call that thing correctly? Um, but yeah, you define all those kinds of things in the twin and, and, it, and then those definitions are stored in a database. And then you could use, you know, like we all have different backgrounds of doing stuff. You know, I've been a programmer and an architect for, for, for probably too long. Um, I, used to, I used to do all this stuff at, when I was at Microsoft. I did a lot of work with um, data replication and um, with SQL Server, and we used to we used to have our Windows Mobile and Windows Phone devices a long time ago, and we used to have a little tiny database called SQL Server CE uh, or SQL Server Compact. But you could replicate the data to that small database, and then you can have offline and do build apps, right, or business solutions. But think of it that way. Imagine now I've defined my digital twins, and they're in my database on my server in my cloud. Yeah. What if my edge nodes, they also have a smaller database. I may have my big giant database here, but I might use a small, you know, because some, some of these databases could, you know, like SQLite or, you know, little tiny embedded databases. You could imagine so that when we talk about doing digital twins at the edge, maybe I'm just going to replicate those definitions from the database structure to a different database structure, like in, in a tiny embedded database so that they're sitting there locally. And then you'll perform the exact same functions there with just, but you'll, you don't, 
you don't need that giant compute power that the cloud has because I'm only talking to a limited number of devices, right? And so I can I can do that. And it could be SQLite, but you know, you can get MySQL or Postgres SQL running in pretty smaller machines as well, you know. Uh, so anyway, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's certainly how you can take all those definitions and twin structures and just put that data model down locally on a smaller database. Oh yeah, that certainly does, certainly does answer the, 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 the question. Uh, now, we move on to the issue of um, security. Uh, you've highlighted a bit of that also. Now, what are the challenges that you, 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 you've seen with, with securing an edge uh, uh, infrastructure and edge computing infrastructure and like any possible solutions? Yeah, yeah. You know, edge computing devices are more exposed or more vulnerable yeah. to attack. Because, uh, you know, at least if you're cloud thing, you know, it's inside some cloud and they've got all kinds of security. But you're right, if I'm putting my little edge device out there, it's exposed to the real world. And so you've got to secure, you have to maybe try to do physical security if you can on the, on the edge device itself, which you may or may not be able to do. Um, simple things, you know, that edge device is probably running some kind of operating system, you know, Linux or Windows you know, something like that. Um, and so you think about, you know, and this goes back to a lot of things we learned over the years with making smartphones more secure. Um, you know, you hear about things like secure boot, uh, you know, that replaced normal BIOS, um, you know, that UFI boot or whatever. Um, so having that secure boot when the thing's coming up, making sure that the device itself, the hard drives are encrypted. You know, if you're using Windows, use BitLocker you know, encrypt the volumes other ways on if it's Linux or something else. Um, encryption, obviously, strong authentication to log in to be able to access that device directly, which needs to be able to remotely talk back to some server to change that over at different times, just like we have to do at work <laughs> and when they make you change your password, um, things like that, just like rolling security keys uh, for IoT devices. Um, and so every step of the way, um, you know, me being a Microsoft guy most of my career puts me in a strange position because most of the people I see doing stuff these days in IoT, it all seems to be about Linux or it's about some kind of real-time operating system. Um, all I would want to do is if it's a larger edge device, you know, like a small PC kind of rugged thing like you would get from like a like Dell makes those yeah. uh, HP Edgeline Advantech a lot of those can run Linux or Windows I would just say don't forget that you get a lot of great security capabilities like if you're doing an embedded like Windows 10 uh, IoT enterprise yeah. for instance yeah. um, it has the ability to do uh, you know that I guess it's kind of like whitelisting um, where, where you can define these are the only processes that are allowed to run on this entire operating system and I'm locking it down. And so if anything else, like a virus or anything else is trying to run or yeah. hacked, you know, the operating system will prevent that from happening. Um, you know, obviously you have basics like antivirus, you know, scanning and updating those things. And I know that sounds old fashioned, but it's still important. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like, it, it's just, you know, when we talk about security, it's like security layers in depth, um, it, you know? And so if you, hopefully you, the operating system on your edge device will give you a lot of those capabilities. Um, and I'm not saying you can't do it with Linux, but Windows makes it easy. If, if you happen to be using Windows, for instance, out there uh, to, to enforce a lot of those physical security, security that has nothing to do with IOT. It's just really locking down that operating system. Um, and then, and then when, when then the IOT part itself, kind of like we talked about, make sure you're not listening. You're just always doing outbound connections. Um, you're always authenticating everything. So, you know, obviously you'll be listening a little, you're depending yeah. on what your edge device does, your IOT devices, it's, you know, it's weird if it's a, if it's an industrial setting like manufacturing and you might be connecting over Modbus or OPC or one of those kind of things, you may find yourself with an edge device with a serial port connecting to a machine or a PLC. 
and it may have to send commands over that PLC, over that serial port to get data back. On the other hand, there may be IoT devices that are posting data at you, you know, over yeah. HTTP, or they might be doing MQTT. If they are, then yes, your edge device actually does have to listen. And so it would have something that's kind of like a web server listening, uh, which is also then goes back to the fact that like, you know, make sure that your embedded operating system has an embedded uh, firewall, for instance, yeah. you know, um, and so, you know, because when you're listening on ports, you know, you need to do that. And so if you're anything that's listening, you, you know, and I, and I think it's probably good practice anyway uh, to, you know, I know you will have to download one separate for Linux, but, you know, with Windows 10, you know, IoT, you know, there's a firewall that's been built in going all the way back to Windows XP. Um, and so make sure that's enabled and make sure it's only listening on the ports that you, you want to listen on, you know, maybe 443 for SSL or something like that. Um, a lot of these will probably sound like your typical boring IT yeah, <laughs> security yeah. ideas. Um, but, you know, but yeah, it's super important since it's not hiding in your data center uh, inside a big building. You know, it's certainly more vulnerable. Uh, so off the top of my head, those are kind of the different layers I would think of to secure that device. Um, and then just also... Uh, you know, it's great, you know, and again, I apologize for sounding like a Microsoft guy. <laughs> you know, the first ever way, when we started doing the notion of updating software over the air to update the devices, yeah. that goes all the way back to the 1990s with Windows Update. You know, when Windows Update was invented, I forgot if we had it on Windows 95, we certainly did with Windows 98, um, you know, consumer operating system. Yeah. That was revolutionary. Um, it, before that, you were having to go at a certain time to download a package and do the install yourself. Having Windows Update, and then later on, Linux would start doing package managers to do something similar. But being able to orchestrate software updates or firmware updates to billions of PCs was a huge undertaking. And that was the first time Microsoft was doing global things that looked like the cloud even uh, back then in the 90s uh, to update PCs. So that you can use that same technology for your edge devices today because um, you need to keep it up to date. You know, like security people will always tell you your device is only secure at a particular moment in time. Like right now it might be secure, but one hour from now, some hackers may have found a vulnerability for your yeah. operating system or your something. And so you have to keep it up to date. And so make sure you have an embedded operating system on your edge devices that can update itself with security patches and update uh, antivirus that can update virus definitions as well, things like that. I think all those things will go into making sure that you've got the most secure edge devices possible. Oh yeah, that's, that's quite interesting. And, and I remember I was watching a video sometime from, from, from some guys from Microsoft, they were explaining how uh, with, with Windows IoT, you are essentially checking that uh, security from ATMs, you know, ATM with Windows. You are essentially yeah. checking that and putting it into a, a gateway. So you can already imagine how secure that makes your, your device there. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, an ATM is a good example of an edge device, right? Exactly. It has Thanks. to be very secure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So now... Um, Quite clearly, we are now at the cusp of, uh, of, 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 of uh, widespread 5G adoption. Uh, what role does the, the edge play given that uh, scenario where we've got like uh, 5G? With like what, 5G? Yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if I think of the edge, like the telco edge and mech um, and how 5G, you know, like if you define what is 5G giving us, there's the obvious things, more bandwidth, more speed, um, lower latency, which allows us to do edge compute inside a base station, for, for instance, uh, if you wanted to. Um, the other thing that, uh, you know, um, 5G also gives you some really interesting things. There's like, a, it's able to do network slicing and create individual slices of the cellular network where you can do quality of service control, kind of like you might do 
on your local area network, you know, with your Cisco gear in your company. Um, and then last but not least, you know, the thing I like most about 5G, how it relates to IoT specifically, is it gives you more capacity. So with the same gear, that same cell tower and all the technology that we use, when you go to 5G, you're going to be able to have a hundred times more devices connected to the same gear than you would with for LTE, for instance. Um, and so that's a huge difference. That, that's how we're going to be able to really start using cellular more for IoT devices. Uh, a lot of those ideas that we've had for maybe smart cities, smart trans, you know, connected cars, um, it's going to give them all that extra bandwidth and headroom that they need, you know, uh, because I think the statistic I read is around a cell tower with 5G in a square kilometer, you'll be able to have 1 million concurrently connected devices is what 5G will support. So that's going to be great for all of us who are in the 5G space and need to connect. You know, we may not have reached, I think we didn't know that there were bottlenecks that we were going to potentially reach with older network technology. Um, Cause you know, we, we, we haven't connected as many devices as we thought we would. Um, so from the, so whether it's a device, an endpoint or an edge node, you know, you've got more capacity, more speed, lower latency. So you're getting a lot of great characteristics that we like things that we're accustomed to. Again, if I'm on the factory floor with the assembly line, I'm probably connecting everything with ethernet, right? Cause there's nothing faster than ethernet and no lower latency than ethernet. But when things have to move around and be agile and change, then you need some kind of wireless, right? And so it's great to see wireless cellular, you know, you've always had Wi-Fi, but having cellular now play a role um, is gonna be a big thing. And so also another great, so with edge, Putting, you know, and again, you're seeing edge in these base stations and these metro data centers. There's uh, Ericsson's done some of that work. I've seen some really cool startups that it almost looks like they're taking a shipping container and just dropping it somewhere in your city. And it's got all this compute and it's connected to a mobile operators network that's between the cell tower and, and before they have you go out onto the open internet. Um, to give better service to everybody with, with 5G, if we're doing more compute out at the edge, instead of waiting for it to go to Google Cloud Platform or Azure or AWS, this is good because it get you know it gets congestion off of the network, and so you see a lot of mobile operators. You know, it's still kind of early days, but you're seeing mobile operators investigating Mac not only because of the cool solutions for putting edge there, but also just the idea that they can get a lot of data traffic off of their broad, their main networks. Um, and so edge is a great way to keep things from being clogged up with too much data, too many people. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, it's certainly interesting. It's still kind of early, but it'll be fun to watch. And I think there's going to be some really neat opportunities uh, for this, for, for Mac, you know, that multi-channel edge gateway, you know, computing is, is, is pretty cool stuff. I think we're going to see a lot of that in the coming years for sure. Yeah. It was certainly be interesting to watch it. Eh? Um, yeah. No, some, those, of it, yeah. some of it's, you know, some of it's almost like a, you, you know, people, a, a, a CDN, you know, yeah. uh, around, you know, to cache things from the internet, trying to download to you to make it faster. Just think of it as a reverse CDN for caching things going up yeah, yeah. Is, is a good way to think about that. You also see people doing mech stuff for things that don't seem very serious, like multiplayer gaming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, if they put gaming nodes uh, out, out at the edge, you'll have, you know, because gamers want lower latency, yeah. ping times to be slower. Uh, so yeah, all kinds of crazy opportunities. Oh, no, that's interesting, that's interesting. Okay, yeah, so now to, so to close off this session, I want to uh, speak uh, about the MOA uh, Foundation. Uh, in, in 2018, you, you, you founded this uh, not-for-profit organization called MOA Foundation. 
can you tell us a bit about what uh, that is about and what, what do you aim to achieve then? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so after me building, either designing or building or both major IoT platforms, you know, at Microsoft and Hitachi, and, uh, and I've done stuff on my own, um, over time, you know, you start to, you know, you, you understand what IoT can do for business and commercial purposes and how it can make money, save money, reduce risk and security. But also over time, I started noticing there's a lot of things in society and the environment or with water or all kinds of things that IoT can be used to help, to help people, to help society, to help the world. And so as I started to learn more about how I could make an impact, I was, I kind of put two things together. I was like, well, if I had an, I like an open source, lightweight IOT platform, that's kind of edge based. It can run on a little device that I could just give away to people, uh, to, to nonprofits or NGOs or, or organizations that are trying to make a difference in the world. Um, you know, I could, I could help make a bigger difference in the world. And then somewhere along the way, and I, I feel like my journey started probably with water issues um, and, and, and finding out, not realizing, you know, how, what a crisis we are going to be in with the lack of fresh water, uh, with climate change. But there's, all, there's issues already. Uh, not enough people have access to fresh water. So I think that's where my journey started. Somewhere along the way, I learned about the United Nations doing their 17 sustainable development goals. Uh, about, and, and you know what? what the, they were great categories for me um, because then I could go, Oh, okay. Poverty. How can IOT help poverty? <laughs> and you, and then you, you dig in and you go, well, what's poverty? What? And you find out maybe a lot of people who are deeply impoverished yeah. also are connected to agriculture and we need to, be, we need to be able to grow more crops, let's say, or orchards need to have more apples or whatever it is. And so you can go, oh, okay, well, I know how IoT can help me with agriculture. I can do, you know, precision agriculture, soil moisture, temperature. I can find out how water and also not using as much water on crops. Uh, I can detect making sure you're not having to use as much chemicals and finding ways to grow more food because we need more food because we have such a growing planet. Yeah. And so you go, oh, okay, I can put, and so, I think along the way, every one of those categories, you know, there's poverty, there's hunger. Well, hunger's tied to the same thing, right? Um, there's water issues. And so you can, you're testing, you know, because what is IoT? IoT is about measuring things and then re and remotely measuring and then taking an action, right? You derive an insight using analytics and then I'm going to take an action. Uh, well, that action we're going to take now is to, to help people. And so the takeaway with Moab Foundation, it's basically two things. Across the 17 sustainable development goals, work with people who can help define use cases where IoT can help across those different categories. And it won't always work with every category. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. So I don't want to force it. But if there's a place where IoT or maybe digital technologies can help, let's write out that use case and then write out maybe the, the plan the, for execution of how I could take IoT technology and sensors and actually go take action on behalf for that. And so, uh, and so the other part, and then so the other part is this Moab platform that I've built, and it's a work in progress, yeah. um, but it's open source platform get, to give away. Uh, and then it's people, you know, people probably volunteering, you know take this technology and this use case, this recipe, this roadmap to go attack this particular problem, you know, that might be in one of those categories. So that's the high level idea. Um, and so we'll, we'll see how it goes. There's a lot of people who are interested in it, but uh, you know, it, it's still early days. I, I need to spend probably, you know, more time with people who are experts in those different categories that are much smarter than I am in those. And then I'm like, here, <laughs> here's the technology. Yeah. 
but it's certainly about giving, you know, and, uh, and, and trying to make the world a better place. And so yeah. it's, it's kind of fun. The setting the uh, way the cause, the setting the way the cause. Now, how, how, how would like one go about uh, getting hold of, of, of the, uh, the more uh, platform? Like, do you have like, uh, is, is it on GitHub or, or how, how does one go about getting hold of the? Yeah, the I'm going to have a new, I'll have a new version that's completely updated that'll okay. be on GitHub before the end of the year. Uh, I have an I have an older version, uh, but the the newer one's more efficient, faster, uh, and so uh, you know with more directions on how to set it up and things mm -hmm. like yeah. that. <clears throat> and so, uh, but yeah, I'll definitely I'll definitely get that information out to folks. But you can go to moabfoundation.org is the website, and you can kind of learn at a high level. And again, you know, it's volunteers; it's a work in progress. And so, getting more documentation on the site on not only the sustainable development goals, but also how would you install Moab? How does it work? Yeah. You know, how to call APIs. Yeah. <laughs> Things like, but honestly, I'm building graphical interfaces. I've been working on that as well to make it easier for people because not everybody knows how to do some of the geeky programming stuff yeah. that you and I do, right? Yeah. So yeah. you've got to make it accessible for everyone. Of course. So, yeah. but yeah, but yeah, okay. it's, it's good stuff. Good stuff. We'll definitely stay in touch on it. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I know. Uh, uh, Rob, that brings us to the end of uh, our discussion here. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your valuable insights. Thanks for having me. It's been really good talking to you.